Amen. Good morning, church. Such an honor to be here with you guys today from, from the pulpit. So it's a, I don't take this lightly to, to be able to get to bring God's word to you. Um, so if you don't know who I am, I'm Will Crum. I'm the pastor of students and their families. So thank you all for, for showing up. We know you could have been anywhere, but you chose to be here on Memorial Day. So, you know, this is special. Uh, I'm, I'm never... Um, uh, this weekend just means so much to us as, as a country. Uh, we had men and women who died for our freedom so that we could be here today. So let us not forget that this weekend. Also, I, I want to congratulate all the graduates that are in the house, all the seniors in high school. You made it through. It's been a crazy year for you guys, the last two years. Uh, and so we're proud of you and we can't wait to see where God leads you. And thank you to all the teachers and administrators who have done so much for our students. All right. That's the adrenaline rush that always hits me right now. All right. <laughs> My twin sister's in the house and she's a teacher. And so uh, I've just heard so much from her through the year, what it's like for them. And so it's just incredible. All right, the adrenaline's gone. All right, so hey, if you have your word, the Bible with you, go ahead and turn to John chapter 17. We're gonna, we're gonna camp out there today. So make sure you get there and we're gonna uh, jump in, all right? So before, let me pray for, for the message today. Jesus, we love you. God, we're so thankful that we could be in this house, that men and women uh, paid the ultimate sacrifice so that we can have freedom. We know our brothers and sisters all over the world, um, God, don't have this luxury. Um, but God, we, um, we are fortunate to, and we, don't, um, we are not forgetful of that. So thank you, Jesus. Thank you for this time that we have in your word. It's in your name we pray, amen. All right, so from humble beginnings, its presence is now worldwide. It impacts all aspects of our daily lives, shapes life's rhythms, expands our possibilities, and creates even as it fulfills desire. Its banner is instantly recognizable wherever you go. Am I talking about the church and the cross of Christ? No, I'm not. I'm talking about McDonald's, right? Everywhere you go, everybody knows McDonald's. It doesn't matter what country you go to, they know McDonald's. And you know what? They recognize that. As you go to their website, you can see their sense of manifest destiny. With this, they say, can you imagine the world without a Big Mac? without chicken McNuggets, without that happy meal, <laughs> right? Well, good news, you don't have to because in 1954, a man named Ray Kraft, Croc, discovered a burger restaurant in California. And now, and now he wrote the first page of our history, right? It's interesting that they have so much share, but guys, let me just tell you that they're struggling. McDonald's is struggling in this time. They've lost market share, they've lost profits. Why? Because there's this sense of health that we now are, are kind of getting back into because we view them as part of the problem with obesity and all the illnesses, just fast food, right? And now in this time, you have these fast casual chains coming in that serve healthier options like Chipotle or Smashburger, even uh, my family's favorite Chick-fil-A. Amen? Thank you. All right. But they've had a lot of bad press as well. They've had documentaries uh, produced about them. One, in remind, one that I'm, I'm brought to mind of is, is Super Size Me, where a gentleman ate nothing but McDonald's for a month. So he ate Big Macs, he ate double quarter pounders with cheese, uh, egg McMuffins, french fries, and all this fare on the menu. That's all he ate for a month and it had devastating effects on him. And McDonald's, out of that, tried to change its image and try to get healthier, but it all fell flat. None of it sold. 
So they're just kind of in the long haul, just kind of holding on, trying to find out what the next trend is that they can get onto. And yet, it just doesn't seem to be working very well for them. At a superficial level, Christianity and McDonald's have a lot in common. Christianity, too, had humble beginnings and now exerts worldwide influence, right? Christianity, uh, like McDonald's, affects all aspects of our lives. Its banner, the cross, is recognizable almost everywhere. Amen. Yet, like McDonald's, Christianity suffers from an image problem, especially in America. Scandals, affairs, inflated egos of pastors and pulpits all across America have diminished the church's credibility and moral authority. Divisions within the church on issues such as abortion, race, same-sex marriage, how to help the poor and the immigrant and gun control gives the impression that the church is beholden to the spirit of the age rather than the truth of God's word. You know what? It's affecting generations too. Just two weeks ago, a study was released that shows 47%, guys, listen to this, 47% of millennials don't know, don't care, or don't believe that God exists. That's shocking. That's shocking. It's overwhelming. The, the tides are coming against the church in America, and it's overwhelming. And you know what? Around the world, belief in Jesus is increasing. You look at the, the growth of the church in Iran, in China, in Africa, in Latin America. It is incredible. But in the West, we are becoming more anti, sub, or post-Christian. It's overwhelming. If this trend holds true, people will continue to grow more hostile to the gospel and capable of understanding and embracing the truth of God's word and his love for his creation. But you know what? It doesn't have to be this way. It doesn't. It doesn't. And I believe we're in a time when the church has been pruned, especially through COVID, and we are in a reset. We are in a reset. We know that the church has survived through marginalization and persecution throughout the ages. And you know what? Christ told us that he would never leave us nor forsake us. Through the whole of church history, Christ has been with his church. He's empowered them to withstand the cultural tides that have come against the church. And like Roman persecution, the time of the Reformation, and even now during this massive cultural shift in the West, why has the church stood the, the test of time? Why? Why has the bride of Christ endured the trends and the tragedies of history? Well, I believe it's because of the prayer Jesus prayed in John chapter 17. This prayer is powerful, y'all. This is a prayer that you need to read daily this, this week. I would challenge you with your families to read this prayer and to hold on to the truth that Jesus prays in this prayer. It's powerful. Guys, he's praying for his disciples, but he's also praying for his church. That's us. It's you and me. He's praying for us. He prayed for strength to stand even when the cultural trends are tough to navigate. And so the first thing I want y'all to see today is the disciples were anchored to the Father through Christ. This is found in John 17, 6 through 11. It says, I have revealed your name to the people you gave me from the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me, uh, given is from you. And because I have given them, excuse me, your words you gave, them, gave me, they have received them and have known for certain that I have come from you. 
They have believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you have given me because they are yours. Everything I have is yours and everything you have is mine. And I'm going to, uh, I'm going to glor- I'm, I am glorified in them. I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in, by your name. Amen. Guys, this prayer occurs right before Jesus is gonna be taken to be crucified. This is the last thing he prayed before that moment. And he knew that his time and his ministry had come to an end. And he knew that his disciples would need protection. At, up to this point, Jesus had been protecting them, but he's praying to the Father, Father, protect them as I have protected them. They were gonna have to withstand attacks from the Roman Empire and from religious elites. And they're all gonna have to do it with the love of Christ. This little group of men would become a bold army for the Lord. It's incredible. And through the disciples' intimate knowledge of Jesus and the words he had given them, they were now anchored to the Father. We see this beautiful Trinitarian fellowship between God the Father and God the Son. We were the Father and he gave us Jesus. Guys, I want you to circle that word gave or given in your Bible. If you you mark in your Bible, go ahead and just circle that. Make a big circle. That's a beautiful word that you need to hold on to. That verse means that you were chosen from eternity past. Pastor preached on this recently in his Ephesians series. It says this in Ephesians 1, 4. It says that you were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in love before him. Not only were you chosen in eternity past, but guys... That process continues to this day. He is continuing to choose you and he will continue to choose you in the future. That's a powerful, powerful statement because he has us in his hands. He goes on to say to the father that the father gave Jesus his words and Jesus gave them to us. Jesus gave us his words. And who do you think we're to give those words to? Are we supposed to just hide them in our heart? No. We're to give them to the world. He's given us a mission. And he tells us that we are anchored to him in that mission. Jesus prays for us that we would be so closely anchored that we would know his words are from the Father. And today, the culture is tossing us around And it can be overwhelming. It is overwhelming. The things that were once self-evident and and true are now called into question in a post-truth world. The waves of Western culture are overwhelming. But you know what? You know what? Jesus is still with us. And his truth still stands today. Jesus understood this at this uh, Jesus, Jesus understood at this moment the disciples were going to face even more trials in the future. The church has faced so many trials throughout history. Right from the beginning, the church faced huge waves of persecution. And I think of uh, during the time of the Reformation that, that trials and tribulations continue, but even in the Reformation, we see that, that the church has stood, stood strong even uh, in, in light of the persecution from the religious elites, right? I think of people like John Wycliffe who decided that the Bible needed to be translated out of the Latin and given to the common man so that we could have the word of God. And you know what? Because he dared to do that, to give the word of God to us, he faced persecution and his, his disciples did as well. But you know what? They stood strong in the face of persecution. They knew that the trends were going against them, but they also knew that Jesus was their strong tower, that he was going to hold them, and that he was going to keep them. Think of our history at First Baptist. Think of the last several years. We faced adversity and trials and tribulations, but look at where God has brought us. 
We have a new staff. We have a pastor with a vision. We are making strides in our community. We are growing not only numerically, but also in health. God has kept us because we have been anchored to the Father through Jesus. Amen. Ultimately, the early church, the reformers, knew, and what we should know now is that Christ is sufficient. He's sufficient. He's sufficient to hold us in the most challenging times. He's sufficient. The second thing I want you to, to note is this, is Jesus, our anchor, prayed for our protection, for our protection. In John 17, 11 through 16, it says, I'm no longer in the world, but they are in the world. I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by your name that you have given me so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I was protecting them by your name that you have given me. I guarded them and not one of them is lost except for the son of destruction so that scripture may be fulfilled. Now I'm coming to you and I speak these things in the world so that they may have my joy complete. I have given them your word. The world hated them because they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. I am not praying that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world just as I am not of the world. Jesus continues his prayer for our protection. In verse 11, Jesus asks the Father specifically for protection. He does it again in verse 12. And in his prayer, he tells the Father that he is no longer going to be in the world because just in a few moments, he's going to be taken by the Roman guard or, or by the Jewish guard, and he's going to be turned over, and he's going to be tried, and he's going to be uh, crucified, and he's going to be buried. And then he was going to be resurrection, red resurrected. And just a few, a little time later, he was going to be raised up to heaven. And he was going to leave us. And I, you know what? That had to be a scary time for the disciples. Just the uncertainty of that whole moment. But you know, I think Jesus was preparing them for the trials and the tribulations, for the waves of the culture that was going to come towards them. You see, there's this incredible passage in Matthew 8 that as a kid, it just grabbed my mind. It was just so vivid to me, just thinking through it. And this is the passage where Jesus had just been doing ministry, and I'm sure he was exhausted, and he wanted to get away. And so oftentimes he would get in a boat, and he would go to the other side of the lake. Well, I mean, think about it, guys. When you're raising people from the dead and you're healing the leopard and the demon possessed and you're feeding 5,000 people or 25,000 people, right? People want to be around you. But it had to be exhausting. Jesus, while he was fully God, he was also fully man. He got tired too. So he gets in a boat and his disciples follow. And I always had it pictured like this. They, they, they go at sunset and get the Sea of Galilee is several miles across and several miles long. And they're in the middle of this lake. It's a deep lake. And it's this beautiful night. You can see the stars. There's no lights to hinder you from seeing this beautiful stars. And the, the moon is just perfect. Just enough light to reflect, to show the way. And it's a clear night. Maybe a couple of wisps of clouds. But all of a sudden they get to the middle of the lake. And what happens? A big storm breaks out. The wind and the waves pick up. And I don't know about you, have you ever been uh, in deep sea fishing or, or on, on water and the water got rough? And, and, and you're doing one of these just trying to keep your feet? I'll never forget, we went fishing as a family several years ago. And like, what, what, six to eight foot waves, something like that? And we were fishing, we were being tossed from side to side. I will tell you, I don't get seasick. But that day, I tried. It was rough. And, and while you could, we were eight miles out, you could still see land, it was still uncomfortable. You're like, what happens if this thing goes down? Right, the fear. And the disciples, even though many of them were fishermen, feared. They were afraid for what's going on. Guys, this was not just a, a little storm. This was tremendous. And they were frightened. 
And where was Jesus? Yeah, I heard it. He was asleep in the back of the boat. Did he fear? You can answer. No. Was he worried? No. No. I think he was showing the disciples that he had everything under control. What did he do? He stood up and said, stop. And the wind and the waves stopped immediately. They obeyed him. He has everything under control. And because of that, they didn't have to fear. Church, I want you to understand this. And I came to this revelation as I was, it was a thunderstorm last week. It was, you know, we've had a lot of big thunderstorms lately. They're, I love them. But I was, my beautiful nine-year-old girl, Carly Mae, sweet Carly Mae, came out of her room. And she just couldn't sleep. She was, she was scared. As most children would be in some of these big storms, especially that side of the house, the wind and the, the rain was blown right up against her window. And the thunder was loud and the lightning was frequent. And she comes to me and she brings me back to her bed and she says, just lay with me, help me fall asleep. And she was asking, she was just telling me she was scared. And I remember this passage. And I was telling her how Jesus prayed for the protection of his disciples, that he was in charge and he could handle this. You know what I realized? This prayer was about me and you as well. He was praying for us. Guys, we're coming out of a season. I mean, we're, we're hopefully through COVID. Knock on wood somewhere. Somebody find some wood and knock on it for me. Thank you. You know, we're not wearing masks. We ripped the tape off. We got word that hopefully schools are going to wear masks next year here. That we're going to be back to normal. We're going to be able to go have lunch with our kids. You know, the economy's picking up. But, you know, deep down in the back of our minds, we're still like, what happens if we have a flare-up? We're nervous. We, look, we go to the grocery store and our bill is skyrocketed. We go to the gas pump and we're like almost three bucks for gas. Like, we're worried. Guys, I, I don't know about you, but there's this sense of worry. I think of mental health with teenagers. Guys, this has been a brutal time for our teenagers. They're the most connected generation in the world, but they're also the least connected generation in the world. They, they can't settle down. They can't turn, turn it off and just rest. It's affecting them. And this COVID made it even worse. They're isolated from their friends. And what we saw is mental health issues uh, skyrocketed. The uh, giving of prescriptions went up. Suicide and suicide attempts went up. If you love the next generation, which I know all of you do, you would be worried about that. It's something you would dwell on. You think of the study about millennials and you're like, wow, I'm worried. What's going to happen to the church and the next generation? It's tough. Living in a post-Christian world is tough and it brings challenges that many of us don't feel equipped for. But I want you to listen to this. Just listen to these words in John 17, 14 and 15. It says, I've given them to you. The world hated them because they are not of the world, just as I, Jesus, am not of the world. I'm not praying that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. You see, we worry so much about things around us, things that we can't control. It would be so much easier, guys. I would love to move my family to 40 acres in the middle of Montana and build a big fence and be self-sufficient. I'd probably go crazy. <laughs> I like the city. But it'd be so much easier. But we've been called to be in the world. He's leaving us in the world. And all that stress all that anxiety and all that worry that we have, guys, Jesus prayed for our protection. 
You know, just a few weeks ago, maybe a month ago, it's, it's, my days are running together, uh, we had the men's retreat. And if you didn't go to the men's retreat, men, this is your call to get signed up right now for next year. The sign-ups aren't up yet. Just stop, call and get your name on the list. It was incredible. Absolutely incredible. During the last session, I'll never forget this moment. It's something I wrote down and I've looked at a couple times since the men's retreat. It's something that I've had to hold true. And it was this sweet moment where brother Jimmy Harkin, love you, buddy. You said something I'll never forget. You stood up and you said, if you ain't praying, if you are praying, you ain't worrying. If you're worrying, you ain't praying. You can't do both. I appreciate you saying that. I needed to hear that right when you said it. You have no clue. Church, Jesus is our great protector. He is trustworthy and he is true and he is faithful to keep us to the end. We are in his hands and he will never let us go. The last thing I want you to see is this holiness comes from being anchored to Jesus. In John 17, 16 through 18, it says this, they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. As we wrap up this prayer, there's a word I want you to highlight again in your Bible, and that word is sanctify. Sanctify. It is just an incredible word. Guys, Jesus is praying that we would be set apart for a special purpose. That word sanctified is the, the word we get holy from. Holy. We've been set apart for a special purpose. I think of it like this. In my house, I have this beautiful room in the front of my house. The chandelier looks just right. It was picked out because it's beautiful. And under that perfectly aligned is this beautiful long table that has a perfect centerpiece. And the room looks perfect unless I study in there. Then that's a different story. But it's beautiful. All the furniture matches. It might be the only room in the house that all our furniture matches. And in one of the cabinets is our beautiful china, our crystal, and our silverware, our silver that we were given at our wedding. Guys, we use that room twice a year. And it gets so much space in our house. But you know when we use it? Christmas and Easter. That room has been set aside, set apart for a special purpose. And really for us, it's a time we get to worship as we celebrate our Savior. It's incredible. Guys, Jesus' disciples have been set apart for his most important mission. They were the foundation of the church. They fulfilled uh, their role as set apart witnesses while remaining in the world. Their example shows us how we too can be in the world and remain faithful and be his witness. Guys, we're not here to sit and listen to sermons and go and sing songs. We all have been given a mission in this world. Every one of us. We've been given families. We've been given coworkers. We've been given neighbors. We've been given each other. As the church, we all have a role. We are not to live a monastic life where we pull out of the world. Well, it's not allowed. That's not what God commanded here. So let me ask this final question. And this is where we wrap up. I'm going to get you to Sunday school on time. I was a little worried about it when I first wrote this. All right? Let me ask you this question. What does it mean to be in the world, but not of the world? What does it mean? So like many great Baptist preachers, and I'm not saying I'm great, but I have a great alliteration for you. And let me just be honest with you. This is the first time I've ever used alliteration in a sermon. So you are first, okay? So I have the three eyes I want you to hold on to and to think through with me. I want you to understand what God's mission for us in our world is. Maybe what we're not to do as well. All right? 
So the first thing is this. We have an option of being in the world, right? But not of the world. And Christians tend to run to one of these three things. And only one of them is correct. I'll, I'll tell you that. The first thing is this, isolation. We tend to isolate because we believe that the gospel needs to be protected instead of shared to the world. Some of us hear the call to remain faithful to the word of God and, they, and we completely disengage from all non-Christians or people who are different from us. This group thinks that it is better to keep far away from the culture so that they will not be tempted. Their legitimate desire to remain faithful to God Truth has caused them to disregard God's mission in the world. Okay? That's isolation. The second I is this inoculation. All right? That's, a, that's an old word for a vaccine. All right? Vaccines, it's a very uh, good word for this day. All right? We're all talking about vaccines, but inoculation is this, believing that the gospel, that they are immune to, uh, this group believes that they are immune to the world and the effects of the world, worldliness, and they hear the call to be faithful to God's mission and immerse themselves fully into the world, into the culture. It goes something like this in my life. When I was in college, all my buddies were like, hey, Will, we gotta go to the bars to share the gospel with of Jesus to, to the people in the bars. After all, we should share the gospel always, but sometimes, just sometimes use words. I think they quoted St. Saint, Saint Francis of Assisi to me. I always thought that was kind of weird because I would watch them come home drunk on the weekends. They took God's call to be on mission seriously but they lost God's truth in that process. That we are called to be different from the world. We are to be of the world, but not in the world. The third thing is this, and this is the best option of the three. And that's to be insulated from the world. And this is what God has called us to focus on the gospel, which protects us from temptation, as we seek to share the gospel with those who don't know Jesus. Insulation means working diligently to balance faithfulness to God's truth with faithfulness to his missions. We, reckon, we recognize we are to live differently from the world, but we are not called to be separate from the world because God has given us a mission to share his truth with the world. We're not just called to read our Bibles and to come here to get fat and happy in our pews. We're called to be mean, lean, aggressive soldiers of the gospel. This doesn't mean we're rude or we're arrogant. It means that we stand on God's truth and share his love with the world. And right now, guys, the church is so passive. The church is, is running scared instead of standing on the truth of God's word. Trends come and go, but God never changes and he never leads us, leaves us. He's always there and he's given us a mission. Will you stand with him? Will you get on his mission? After all, guys, Jesus prayed for you. He prayed that you would be anchored to the father through him. He prayed for your protection and he prayed that you would be set apart to live on mission for him. So where are we, church? As I wrap up and as the band comes, I just want you to think about this. Where are we? Where are you? Are you anchored to the Father? Do you know Christ as your Savior? Is church just something that you go to on the weekends and check it off? but you don't have a real relationship with the Father? Have you been anchored? In this time of invitation, this is a time for you to, to ask that question and get real with yourself. Are you anchored to the Father? Guys, are you struggling with, with the tides? Are you worried about the way the trends are going? Are you praying with Jesus that he has given us all the ability and everything we need to stand firm. 
If you're struggling with worry, pray. Pray that God would take that worry from you, that you would stand strong. I don't know what God's doing in your life right now. I don't know what he's speaking to you. But when we read God's word, it should change us. It should cause us to think critically about where we are. Where is that? Where are you? So in just a moment, the band's gonna play. We're gonna have ministers up here and you can, you can use this as an altar. We'll leave you alone as you pray. You can come talk to one of us about and, and, and pray with us or ask us about what it means to, to follow Christ. We would love to talk to you. But guys, just know that Christ is in control and he has us in his hands. That will never, ever change. Jesus, we love you. Thank you for your word that you've given us. Thank you that you have blessed us. Thank you that you keep us. Thank you that we have protection in you and that you are the rock that will never be moved. The church has stood the trends of the time through the last 2,000 years. And it will continue to do so until you come back. God, whatever you need to do in our lives right now, I just pray that you begin to speak to us individually. God, that we would listen and we would respond to you. And God, ultimately, as we leave here today, I pray that we would hold on to the truth that you are in charge of everything, that we would live boldly and we would proclaim your goodness to all the world. And Jesus, it's in your name we pray, amen.